Welcome back. So we're going to finish up with early modern English by focusing on the phonology, which is arguably the most um, substantial changes linguistically that happened during this time period. We've touched on it a little bit in some of the previous lectures, but we're really going to dive in this lecture to see what these sound changes were. These were some of the most substantial ones. This has affected our spelling system. It's affected the way that we pronounce things in our everyday life. Um, it's something that affects us today. So this is a really important aspect of uh, just a change throughout the history of English um, that we'll spend um, time on in this lecture talking about. So with phonology, we'll notice that there's changes in both the consonants and the vowels. The consonants are nearly identical to present day English by this time period, and we'll see that even though there are some changes to certain environments where some consonants are or are not pronounced any longer, the consonants themselves haven't changed much, and by the end of early modern English, it looks almost, the IPA chart for English looks almost identical to the present day IPA chart. And we'll see that um, a little bit. But I want to focus a little bit on the vowels because these went under some major changes during this time period, the most notable being the great vowel shift. So the great vowel shift is something you may have heard of before. This is a phonological process that involved the raising of the long vowels in Middle English. So any of the long vowels that we had from the Middle English time period underwent this sound change that drastically altered the way that we pronounce many of our different words. So the things from Middle English, like the open syllable lengthening and the closed syllable shortening, led to which words were in an environment to change and which words weren't because this only affected the long vowels. So those words that ended up lengthening their vowels in Middle English would have undergone this system. The vowels that shortened during Middle English would not have undergone this system. So from one of the examples that we saw previously in our class where we had seca and seca for seek and sick, the seca for sick would have undergone the shortening and then was not involved in the great vowel shift. But seek, you notice the vowel change in how we pronounce it today, did undergo the vowel shift change. Vowels were already, um, so the vowels that were in the highest position, so if we're thinking about height in the mouth, so like low, mid, high, high vowels that were under in this position that did change ended up sort of falling from the top and became diphthongs instead. So some of our present day diphthongs came about as a result of the great vowel shift as well. Um, short vowels were not affected by this, so this is where we get some distinctions in pronunciation between words that might otherwise be similar. Um, and some of the earliest changes probably took place in the mid vowels, the long A and the long O. Um, this is sort of based on some evidence from earlier texts, so seeing texts that were in flux, these were the sounds that were more likely to have undergone the um, vowel change first in some of the texts that only had some of these changes, um, and then after that the high vowels would have changed. So this was sort of a combination of both a push and a pull shift, where the mid vowels moving first sort of pushed the high vowels out of their spot, and then it also sort of created a pull shift for those low vowels to move up as well. The shift started in the south of England, so as with many of the changes we saw in previous times, so with Middle English, change seemed to happen first in the London area and in southern parts of England, and slowly moved northward. So as the standardization increased and as the sort of news moved north from London, um, the changes would have ch changed and moved um, with that as well. So this is something that took a long period of time to go through. This is something that underwent change over several hundred years. This wasn't just an overnight kind of thing. But to illustrate the sound that were most affected. These were the long vowels in all positions where something like bata would become bait, so the a becoming an a sound, the e sound would become a as well. Um, e and a sometimes became more like an e sound, so you get beat and beat that used to have different pronunciations but now are pronounced the same. And then things that had an e sound, so bita would have become bite, so it, it sort of collapsed into that diphthong as a result. The back vowels did the same thing, so a for bot became boat, it became that long O sound. The O in boat became boot. The U in something like boot became bout. And you can see this in some of our spelling. So especially with something like beat with two E's or boot with two O's, you can see that initially these were long vowels. There's two of those vowels there. And it shows how they used to be pronounced, but now we've undergone this change. We pronounce them higher, but the spelling hasn't changed. So bait becoming beat, the A sound is still reflected in the spelling, boot becoming, like boat becoming boot, the U sound is spelled with two O's because it used to be pronounced as a long O. 
And there's a lot of the sort of dates for this that are not entirely sure. Um, it's impossible to completely determine because it would have varied from dialect to dialect. It would have started earlier in the southern areas. It would have taken longer to reach some of the northern areas. It's seen as beginning around the end of the Middle English time period and was seen as mostly completed by the end of the 16th century. But you can see some 17th century texts that are still in flux um, that are still showing signs of this process still in play and not having completely finished yet. Um, this is still, in some cases, not uniformly complete. So some of these changes took generations to complete. In Shakespeare's time, um, you would have seen a lot of things that were sort of in process. So the E and the U sounds were probably starting to become diphthongs, but would have been more like an U and an U sound, rather than actually dropping all the way to an A ah for that first sound like we have today. And as these vowels shifted up, the length distinctions also disappeared. So length in the vowels is no longer going to be phonemic. We don't have a difference between long vowels and short vowels that contribute to meaning, at least. There are differences in how long we pronounce vowels, just conceptually, if we look at a, a waveform of them. But they're no longer phonemically distinct between each other. And so even though the short long distinction is no longer actually there, we've sort of gotten rid of that because of this change, the spelling may not have completely reflected this. So bit and uh, bite were, would have been similar except for lengths. So it would have been bit and bit, um, where there may have been a tense or lax distinction, but they may have had similar qualities. Um, after the great vowel shift, they have completely different um, sounds. So we still have bit, and then we get to bait. Um, or bite, excuse me. Um, and we still have some vowel length differences that exist in present day English, but these aren't phonemic distinctions. This is typically the result of something like an open or a closed syllable where, where B has a longer vowel than beat um, because it has that consonant there. So we sometimes in open syllables will pronounce a vowel a little bit longer, but it's not something that's going to change the meaning of the word. We don't have a difference between B and B. Um, so to be or not to be is pronounced the same either way because they're both open syllables with the same sound in them. To give an example of this happening in progress, this can kind of show you some of those examples and the time frame, the estimated time frame for where these changes would have taken place. So something like beta becoming bite um, would have undergone a sort of in progress change for a long period of time and been something closer to bite. Um, and then we get to bite with the ah and e sound by present day. Others had changed a little earlier. So beat, so going bait to beat um, is something that by the 1500s um, would have already undergone its change and would have been pronounced more like beat anyway. Um, you'll notice that another change that's sort of going along with this is that those final vowels um, that led to the environment for a lot of these vowels to lengthen in the first place um, ends up dropping during this time period as well. So beta becomes bait and then bait becomes beat. Um, abate going from abata to abat to abet to abate. Um, so there's several different changes that you can see kind of taking place during this time period. So the ones you see in blue are the ones that are sort of in progress. They've started changing, but they haven't reached their final form like what we would see in present day English, whereas others that you see in the black is showing when it would have reached the final form that we still have in present day. So you can see that some of these are changing and some of them are finishing at different time periods um, based on the evidence that we have from things like Shakespeare, things like um, other sorts of poetry to see which words rhymed with each other and which words didn't at various time periods during the early modern English period. And we can see a pretty notable change if we compare some Middle English words to early modern words after the great vowel shift took place. So fief from Chaucer would have become five from Shakespeare, so that final sound is becoming voiced and we're seeing the vowel change. Med um, becomes mead, uh, clana becomes clean, and during Shakespeare's time would have been more like clean. Um, so not quite undergoing all of the changes yet. Nama becomes name. Rota becomes root. Gota for goat becomes goat. Um, dun for down. Um, so you can see that the long vowels there that are in the Middle English are now in Shakespeare's English changed and sometimes still pronounced longer, but not distinctively longer. So there wouldn't have been root versus root as a distinction and meaning. 
There were exceptions, however, to the Great Vowel Shift. So there are some things that um, there were some other environments and some other reasons why some vowels changed and some didn't. Um, some of this is due to dialect variation and different kinds of mixture and exposure to other forms of language. Um, so like the A sound um, usually became E, but sometimes it didn't, especially in words that had shortened prior to this time period. So this is where we get a distinction between a word like head, thread, death, deaf that didn't undergo the vowel change, and words like cheat, leaf, treat, and wreath that did undergo the vowel change, where some of those, even though they're not in, they're in the same general environment, they're all in closed syllables, some of them lengthened and some of them didn't, um, or some of them shortened and some of them didn't, and this led to a difference in how they end up being pronounced, even though we're spelling them the same because they would have had the same spelling and the same pronunciation before the great vowel shift. This is what gives us some of those differences, even though we maintain a spelling that looks the same, the pronunciation changed in some examples, but not in others. Some of this change was still occurring at the end of the early modern period, so even as we're moving into modern English in the late 1700s and early 1800s, some of these changes may not have been fully complete yet at that point. Um, so there's a couplet from an Alexander Pope uh, writing where Pope would pronounce T as T, and you can kind of see this with things that rhyme. So when you're looking at couplets, um, soft yielding minds to water glide away and sip with nymphs their elemental T. So seeing the rhyming schemes in things gives us a lot of information for which vowels had changed and when they had changed. Some other examples was there were some fluctuations with the long O sound in Middle English, where a lot of them predictably went to an OO sound, so boot, loose, mood, pool, soon. But others shortened from the OO sound to an O uh sound, so it's still rounded, but now it's more lax, and so we get words like foot and good and hook and wood as a result of that. And then sometimes the uh further unrounded and became more like a schwa sound for something like flood and blood. And so we're seeing that some of these words sort of changed further after the vowel change had taken place to give us our present day pronunciation. So the great vowel shift wasn't just the be all end all for these sound changes in many of our words. And some of these other changes led us to things that look similar in the spelling but have different pronunciations as a result of some of these additional sound changes. Another example is of, from Pope um, is writing, rhyming good with blood, which would have been how it had been pronounced then, showing that it had not yet unrounded to blood. Um, so we can see examples through these different kinds of couplets of where something was in the change progress during a certain period of time. There are still some in this this sort of realm of the oo versus u, uh, where some people might pronounce it with an oo and some people might pronounce it with an u. Uh. Um, so in my dialect, root. Um, is still an oo, but soot would be with an uh, roof, room, all have oo. So I haven't changed the oo to an uh in most of these examples, but there are many speakers that would say something like root and roof and rum um, instead of using an oo sound in those words. Thinking about some of the other sounds that have changed, some of the other vowels changes during this time, all of the remaining final unstressed E's were pretty much lost. The only time that we still see them is in allomorphs, so in our plurals, things like judges and churches, where we need to have that, that uh sound sort of put in between those different um, strident sounds. Um, some things with the ah sound changed, so ah became ah frequently in early modern English, and sometimes it reverted back to an ah sound before an R in the 17th century. In the 18th century, ah became ah before a voiceless fricative, um, so things like class, path, fast, um, and then this wouldn't have changed in words that were followed by another vowel, so classical would still have retained an ah, but notice that this is more British English pronunciation. This is not reflected in the American English pronunciations, which didn't switch back to an ah sound, so we still say class and path and fast. Um, ah became aw ah before an L and after a W, um, so fall, um, all, walk, salt um, would have in many cases been pronounced more like fall, all, walk, um, and we still have some dialects that do this today while other American English dialects do not. Um, and then the uh became an uh, except when after a labial consonant, so you see run um, and hut, um, but you see full and pull and bowl and push. So after these labial consonants, you're still seeing this uh sound. And they sometimes don't sound all of that distinct, but the biggest distinction here is the rounding. So they're relatively close to each other in the mouth, but were unrounded after those labial sounds. O became O before L in many cases. So bolt, cold, old, bowl. Um, this is something that 
is in flux in some dialects as well, where there's a lot of dialects um, that would still pronounce it more with an open O before an L sound, um, and others that may have changed it even further. In my personal dialect, I actually have it raised a little higher. It's a little closer to an OO sound, so bolt um, is sometimes how you might hear me pronounce some of those ones. And then R has a big influence in a lot of things as well. And this is just a common fact. R is a, is a tricky consonant that changes the vowels that are around it because of how we pronounce an R sound. So in general, a following R tends to lower vowels just across languages, just anatomically. This is something that's common. And during the late Middle English period and continuing through early modern, there was a widespread lowering of things like R to R. Um, and so in some instances, this would have been permanent. And so words were respelled to reflect this because it was happening as things were starting to um, be uh, codified in our spelling. So far, star, farm, um, born, um, for fair, stare, derk, ferm. Um, so the spelling changed as well as the pronunciation in some of these cases, especially if these changes happened earlier on in the time period before a strong spelling had been sort of codified for everyone. Some of the lax vowels also changed, and this is a relatively more recent change. So a lot of dialects in Northern Britain still don't change this to an uh. So in American English, we would say dirty and girl and her and hurt, where it's almost like there's not even a vowel there. We're just using that R because it's sort of gotten sort of laxed and turned into a schwa. But in many British dialects, especially in the northern parts of Britain, um, you'll still hear the same one. So you'll hear something like Garrel, um, where you still have an S sound there instead of um, a schwa, like what we would have in American English. So we're starting to see some of these changes affecting some areas and affecting others less. So as American English started splitting, we had some of these changes that were still taking place during this time in Britain, not taking place in the same way um, in American English dialects. So R following a long vowel sometimes also blocked the raising or the creation of diphthongs. So some words like E and O and U in Middle English would not have changed if there was an R there. So we see some variation and some differences as a result of an R next to some of these vowels as well. So the last bit of vowel talk we'll do is with the diphthong. So in general, the tendency throughout English has been for diphthongs to smooth out and to become single sounds. The early modern period is no exception. We lost a lot of uh, diphthongs during this time period. Um, and so while some of them smoothed, there were also some that were created through the great vowel shift as well. So Middle English probably had seven diphthongs, u, au, 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 ai, um, ui, oi. And all except for the ui and the oi um, became simple vowels. And part of this is that, that those last two were borrowed from French. And so they were a little bit different than some of the other ones that maybe had a longer period of time to start flattening out. We still have the conflation of the ui and oi sounds from French that became just the single diphthong oi, so in something like boy. Um, that's where that diphthong comes from. So it wouldn't have been coming from the great vowel shift like the other common uh, diphthongs that we have in, in English today. Um, and some of them became where we get some of these other pronunciations. So eu, eu had sort of conflated just into eu. And then by the 16th century, this became eu. So instead of pronouncing the full vowel as an e, it became sort of palatalized with the y. And this is why things that are spelled with the u are often pronounced with that y in front of it. So pure, mute, hue um, would have had an e, u pronunciation at first, and then sort of conflated into this palatalized u kind of sound. We also see a lot of other changes that from Middle English that were diphthongs sort of changing into single sounds. So owl becoming o, so cause, hawk, claw. Um, before some sounds, um, it would have become an aw sound. So in front of palm, calm, half, calf, um, we see an aw or an a ah coming out of that instead. Um, and then the o sound would have just become O. Oh. So this is something that is still sometimes pronounced as a diphthong, especially in American English, where we still pronounce it more like O. Oh. Um, but it would have gone from the lax version um, into the tense version for that. So no, grow, soul um, would be examples of that. And then the I um, became A in many cases. So this is where going from day to pay, um, day, pay, raise, eight. Um, where we get just the A sound in those ones. And you can see the spelling is different and sometimes reflected and sometimes not. So that A-Y would have been an indicator of that, the A-I in raise, the E-I in eight, um, where the two different vowels together had sort of conflated into one, but are still reflecting a previous pronunciation in their spelling. 
thinking about some consonant changes which did also happen there's a lot of smallish changes that happen in consonants that we'll talk about so things like the post vocalic allophones of h so ch and ch disappeared in most dialects during this time period so we either just don't pronounce it at all or we pronounce it as an h um, and so we can see that it just completely disappeared before t in things like sight straight caught um, it was lost or became an F in final position, so though versus tough. So those GH spellings that are always very different, there's not always a clear an indication of exactly when some of those are going to change. So whether it's lost or becomes F, we don't exactly know all of the environments for why that would happen because looking at that, they're in the same environment, but sometimes it's lost in a word like though, sometimes it's F in a word like tough. Um, we totally lose the H and the CH um, in the in many of these examples, and these often created lengthened vowels. So the vowel lengthens to take up the same amount of time as to cover the consonant that was deleted or lost. Um, the O sound, our L sound, is lost after low back vowels and sometimes before labial or velar consonants. So in the words like half or palm or folk. Um, but this is not something that's always consistent. Some of that, that does not happen in all dialects. So for me personally, I would say palm and still have an L. For folk, I would still have an L. And so for some people, these would, would have changed in many of these environments and still are. It's more common to hear something like folk. Um, but this did not change after some other vowels. It didn't change before dental or palatal consonants. You still get salt with an L. You still get bolt with an L. Um, so this change is not in all dialects of English, but it is a common change that took place. This is also the period of time where some of those consonant clusters finally stop being pronounced as clusters. So things like G and K are lost in their initial position before end, late in the 17th century. So going from GNU to NU, going from KNO to NO, or KNIF to KNIFE. So we used to pronounce both of those letters. We lost them, but they were already in the spelling because this did happen later in time. So they were already pretty codified in the spelling, and we just kept them even though we don't pronounce them anymore. We lose the W also before an R pronunciation, so from going from wrong, wrong, wrinkle to just wrong. It's kind of hard to pronounce a W and an R together, so it kind of makes sense that we would have lost that. And then some other ones are things like T and D sometimes dropping before clusters with S. So in something like castle instead of castle, hasten instead of hasten. Um, it's lost at the end of words in some dialects, so especially in colonial American English. Um, you can see this very frequently in semi-literate spellings where people are writing how they talk, but they don't know any of the sort of prescriptive rules. So he, seeing par for part or west for west showed that this was lost during um, that time. We also dropped R's frequently, um, especially before S in Middle English. This was extended to other words and other positions. So by the 18th century, you can see this in a lot of semi-literate spellings. And this is a feature that still exists in some dialects today. So quarter, ma, match, brother, for quarter, march, brother. Um, so sort of emulating what might sound more like a Boston kind of dialect. D changed to an ev sound when it was preceded by a major stress and followed by R. So this is where we get the the sound in things like father and mother. Um, so going from father and motor, um, which would have still had a D in Old English by today and by the end of the early modern period, it had switched to a the sound during this time. Some other changes, we lost G word finally in many dialects. Most American dialects don't pronounce it at the end of words even though it's spelled. So we started getting a phonemic ng sound where we have something like sing um, versus sing, which is not really how most people would pronounce it. But then this creates an environment of it being exactly the same as a word like sin. So sing, sin, um, the difference being an N or an ng sound can create a phonemic environment for this. Um, some unstressed vowels reduced and continued through early modern English, and so it, some of these turned into consonants. Um, so we started putting palatal glides before some of these vowels, so tenor became tenure. Um, we see lots of other examples of this as well with um, some of the alveolar sounds. So if it was a sia or a zia or a tia or a dia, they became these strident sounds. So sia became sh, zia became zh, tia became ch, Dia became j, 
And so this is where we get some of those sounds that you can see are spelled very differently depending on how they may have been pronounced previously. And these changes ended up giving us some additions as separate phonemes in English. So previously our ng and our zh were just found as allophones in English. They were only found in certain kinds of environments. But because of these sound changes, they became phonemic sounds in the language itself. So looking at the actual consonant chart, you can see this looks almost identical to our present day consonant chart. The only thing we're missing still at the end of the early modern period is the glottal stop, which we haven't gotten yet. That's a much more recent addition that we don't see until modern English. But all of the other sounds are pretty much the exact same as what we have today. So we've gotten rid of all of those other allophones that we don't pronounce any longer. Um, we only have the voiced wa sound now. Um, all of the fricatives are now phonemic. All of our nasals are now phonemic. So it looks almost exactly identical to our present day English um, sounds. The vowels are also starting to look much closer. There's still a few that haven't quite changed fully to what we have in present day English, but we're starting to see some um, of the lax vowels. We're starting to see distinctions between tense and lax vowels. We're seeing the um, use of those diphthongs going to single vowels and some of the sounds going to just oo or u. Um, the only diphthong that sort of remains from Middle English is that oi sound um, that's coming from French. So we see a much closer vowel system to what we have in today's language language as well. So that covers early modern English, that covers a lot of these sound changes and things that took place during this time period. Some of the biggest changes during this time were in the sound system. So as always, if you have questions, send me an email, schedule office hours, let's talk about it in class. Um, and that is early modern English.